Okay, so we're going to talk about chapters 9 and 10. Introduction to the t-statistic, one sample and two sample t-statistics. So what we talked about before was that um, we looked at the z-scores, and uh, z-scores require that we know the population standard deviation or variance. And in most situations, we don't know it, because if we did, like I say all the time, we wouldn't need statistics. So now we have to do a little bit more work. I mean, it's not a trick, because we have done the z-scores, but we actually have been uh, using z-tables, and we're now going to use our samples to approximate the population, and so we're going to use uh, t-tables instead. So since we've been looking at the z-score, we've just been kind of making up the population standard deviation because we don't really know it. So now we're using our sample to estimate the population standard deviation or mean or both. And we're using our samples instead of the population, so we have to use a t-table instead of the z-table. But we're just going to let SPSS do that for us. Oops. Okay, so the t-distribution is a sampling distribution of sample means when the population variance, so the, the Greek letter sigma squared, is not known. So we have to use a t-distribution with a mean of mu, which is the hypothesized mean, and a standard error of the mean, which is the same thing, but now we're looking at Latin letters, right? We said last week we had sigma sub m, so the standard error of the mean. Now it's not Greek because we're getting this value from our sample. So this is the standard error of the mean of the sample, where our standard deviation comes from the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. You take the square root of that. We don't have to do the calculation anymore. Um, and it's over the square root of the sample size. So because it's dependent on the sample size, there's a different distribution for every sample size until you get to about 120 and then it approximates the normal distribution and you can use uh, the T and the Z scores are pretty much synonymous. But instead of the Z form, it's exactly the same uh, formula. So instead of Z equals the sample mean minus the hypothesized mean of the population over the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, now it's t is equal to that. But nothing has changed. Everything is the same, and we're going to do, we're just going to do this all in SPSS. So t distributions are very much like a z distribution. Uh, it's bell-shaped, bell symmetric, and unimodal, meaning it only has one hump. The mean is the center of symmetry. It changes as the sample size changes. It's associated with a unique number of degrees of freedom. And you remember, degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. And for infinite degrees of freedom, it's identical to the normal distribution. And in reality, when you get to about 120, it's pretty much identical to the normal distribution. So here we have a picture. Um, in red is the standard normal distribution, right? So it's a little bit higher peak with skinnier tails. And the t distribution with four degrees of freedom, so five in our sample size, so n minus one would be five minus one is equal to four degrees of freedom. It's almost, it's almost the same. It says it has heavier tails um, because there's more probability in the tails and less in the hump, um, but it's pretty darn close. Okay, so let's do an example. A sample of n equals 150 individuals is selected from a population with a mean of mu, uh, a mu of 20, a population mean of 20. A treatment is administered to the individuals in the sample, and after the treatment, the sample mean is 21.4, with a standard deviation of 4.1. Is the sample sufficient to conclude that the treatment has a significant effect? Uh, use a two-tailed test with an alpha level of significance 0.05. So now we're having the T formula. So it's just like the Z formula. The hypothesized, no, sorry, the sample mean minus the population hypothesized mean over the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So now we have to look at the specific sample size to find our critical values. Before we had used point, uh, plus or minus 1.96. Remember I said between plus or minus 2 specifically for the z-score of 1.96 or uh, positive or negative. Anything in excess of that is a significant finding. Well, now with our degrees of freedom, we have to use um, a t-table. 
but we're just going to use our, our SPSS. And so remember, degrees of freedom is n minus 1, so 150 minus 1 is our degrees of freedom is 149. And we're going to state our hypothesis so that the mu of the treatment is equal to 20, which was the hypothesized mean, so the treatment did not have an effect, or the mu of the treated sample is, is not equal to 20, and the treatment did have an effect. Step two is to set the alpha level, which is always 0.05. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. And now we calculate the test statistic. So we compute the test statistic and evaluate the p-value. So I just put in all the values, um, 140, 150 of those values. I do analyze, compare means, one sample t-test. I only had one variable, so I bring it over and I test it against 20. So we look at the output, we get 21.4, our standard deviation of 4.05, and we see that we have a t-value of 4.279, which is large, so our significance is 0.001. So the p is low, so the null must go. So we reject the null hypothesis and say that there is a difference. So we want to calculate now the effect size. To measure the effect size, uh, a measure of effect size is intended to provide a measure of the absolute magnitude of a treatment effect, independent of the size of the sample being used. And we talked about this before, that small is 0.2, medium is 0.5, and large is 0.8. So the Cohen's D is the mean difference, which is 1.4, which we got from here, 1.4, over the standard deviation, which we get from right here. And we get uh, 0.246 or 0.25 for the small to medium effect. Now there's another <clears throat> type of effect size called R squared, which is called the coefficient of determination. When we get correlation, we calculate correlation, we get the R value. If we were to square that, we would get the coefficient of determination. But we can also calculate it from using our T values and our degrees of freedom. So if we calculate, if we know that our T value is 4.27 or 4.3, and our degrees of freedom is 149, our uh, benchmarks are, are different for these than they are for these. So Cohen's D is 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8. For coefficient of determination, it's 0 0.01, 0 0.09, and 0.25 is considered large. So we calculate by saying we square the T value and we divide by the square of the T value plus the degrees of freedom. So I get 4.27 squared over 4.27 squared plus 149. We calculate it out and we get 0.113 which is between medium and large. And the way we interpret this is that 11, so we can turn this into a percentage, we move the decimal place over to the right two spaces, and we get 11.3% of the variance in the dependent variable can be attributed to the independent variable. So we write up the conclusion, we say the treatment did have an effect, T of 149, which we get from the degrees of freedom, we get our T value from here, 4.279. P is less than 0 0.01 with a Cohen's D of 0.25. Note, we never say that the P value is equal to 0 0.000. We say that it's just less than 0 0.01 or sometimes 0 0.001. If we get a non-zero decimal place, we'll say that P is equal to 0.25 or whatever you end up getting here. You'll just say it to, the, to two decimal places. And this is how you write the results in APA. So now, the next thing we want to do, that's for one sample, and it's not often that we do one sample t-test. What we're usually concerned about is uh, testing uh, two, di two different groups to see if there's any difference between two groups. So the independent t-test measures the differences between sample means of two independent participant groups. The independent variable is categorical, nominal, and the dependent variable is continuous, either interval or ratio, and you cannot Causal relationships cannot be assumed unless you're doing an experiment. So, for example, a researcher wants to know if teaching method, either a traditional or progressive teaching method, impacts reading achievement. And also note, the word impact implies that there is an intervention happening and that you are comparing groups. So if you use impact and then you um, go and talk about correlation, you're, you're doing the wrong um, data analysis. The impact implies uh, comparing groups. So in order to do independent samples t-test, we have to have uh, some assumptions must be met. First, the observations within each sample must be independent, 
of each other, not influenced by the any other um, observations. The two populations from which the samples are selected must be normally distributed, and that's sometimes violated, and we say that these tests are often robust to violations of normality, so it's not a make or break, number two. But number three kind of is. The two populations from which the samples are selected must have equal variances, also called homogeneity of variances, or you might also hear homoscedasticity. I don't think it's in, it might be in the text. I know it's in other text, uh, statistical textbooks. But we want to know, are they the same? Homogeneous means the same. And we want our variance, variances to be a, the same going into the test so that we can see if there's a significant difference. We know it's not just because we had two different groups to begin with. If this is violated, it can negate any meaningful interpretation of the data from an independent measures experiment. All right, so here's our example. In this study, we are trying to assess the effects of teaching methods on reading achievement by comparing the average reading achievement score in different teaching method groups. The data represents reading scores for 16 children being taught under two different teaching methods. So our research question is, does teaching method impact reading achievement? So our independent group, I mean our independent variable is a group, traditional versus progressive, and then our dependent variable is the reading score. So if these are the data just written out, we have traditional method and we have progressive method, and then we have reading scores for each. But this isn't how we would put it into SPSS. What we would do is we would have teaching method and we would give this the label one, and then <clears throat> we'd have teaching method two and give it the label two, and over here we'd say one is equal to tr traditional, two is equal to pro progressive, and then we would have the corresponding scores. So. Let's do step one. Does teaching method impact reading achievement or null in our alternate hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that the mu of, the, of traditional is equal to the mu of progressive. Teaching method does not have an impact on reading achievement. And our alternate is that the mu of the, tra of the traditional is not equal to the mu of the progressive, so teaching method does impact reading achievement. Our alpha level is always 0.05. So we calculate the test statistic. We go analyze, compare means, independent samples, t-test. We would bring the dependent variable, the score, over to the test variable. We bring the independent variable over to the grouping variable, teaching method. And we get these two little question marks. So I click define groups, and I have labeled group 1 is 1 and group 2 is 2. I could have labeled it 0 and 1, or 10 and 20, it doesn't matter, but you just have to know how it's coded in the, co in the computer so that you can tell SPSS what to look for. Then you hit continue, and it, this will become blue again, and you hit OK, and it will give you the output. And our output always gives us the descriptive statistics, and the way that we can tell is we, we look and we see, oh, the traditional did slightly better than the progressive method. Okay, so the first thing we want to look at is Levine's test for equality of variances. Back when we talked about the assumptions, this one, number three. The two populations from which the samples are selected must have equal variances. So this tests that they are equal. The null hypothesis is that they are equal. The alternate hypothesis is that they are not equal. So we want them to be equal. Therefore, we do not want to reject the null. So we don't want the p to be low here. Just remember that we, for the Levine's test, we want the p to not be low so that we can then say equal variances are assumed. This is the only test where even if we fail this assumption, we have output. What it does is it, it changes the degrees of freedom. You can see we have 14 whole, whole numbers here, 14 people, and here we would have this kind of adjustment. But pretty much everything else is the same, except for the confidence intervals. Anyway, so we look here and we say, okay, the p-value is not low, so we're going to stay in this top row. This That's done for this. We don't report anything about Levine's test other than that, that we did not fail, uh, that we did not um, fail this assumption. We look at our t value and we see that um, the t is 0.11, which is almost zero. It's very small. Our degrees of freedom is 14 and our significance is very large, so we do not reject the null. Our mean difference is not as negligible. 
Okay, so we do Cohen's D. You can just click on this and it will take you to the calculator. Or what you do is you'd go back to here and you would use this information to plug it in to find your Cohen's D. 4.75 for group 1, 2.5 and 8, 4.6, 1.99 and 8. We hit calculate and we get the Cohen's D of 0 0.06, which is not very large at all. If I were going to find the, the coefficient of determination, I'd square my T value and divide by the square of the T value plus the degrees, the degrees of freedom and I get 0 0.09 and it doesn't really make any sense to do an effect size with a non-significant result, but what I would say is that 0.09%, so barely one, not even 1%, 0.1% of the variance in the outcome variable is explained by the dependent variable. And that's how you do that.